This is Uhuru Zem News. Cornflakes for Jihad, the Boko Haram origin story. Part 2 and 3 The Final Nigeria's organized Islamic terrorism problem did not start in 2009. It's a lot more insidious than you think. To those in the know however, the incidents of December 25, 2011 are not only expected, but are likely to intensify and become more regular. This is because while the Nigerian public up to this point has been fed with what amounts to a tiny percentage of the actual story behind the Boko Haram group, this group has in fact been incubating and nurtured at the highest levels of the theological, economic and political spaces in northern Nigeria. Boko Haram in reality, is so much bigger than Muhammad Yusuf and Abubakar Shako that reducing it to those two men serves to miss the actual story spectacularly. To start to get some of the picture of what Boko Haram, Haram is, and where it came from, let us retreat from 2011 to 2006 to read an excerpt from a letter written by the permanent representative of Nigeria to the United Nations, Aminabi, Wali, addressed to the chairman of the Counterterrorism Committee. The letter read, Court sitting in Abuja on Friday, March 3, 2006, granted an application stopping and freezing the financial and economic assets including business properties and things within Nigeria, belonging to or associated with Ahmed Idris Nasreddin, Nas Trade Nigeria Limited and three other companies in that group. The assets were accordingly forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria in the interim. The Nigerian Department of State Services has also done considerable work in respect of tracking down terrorists and freezing and or seizing their assets. It has set up counter-terrorism centers in Lagos, Kano, Maiduguri, and Abuja to facilitate its surveillance. In 2005, the service arrested six local Taliban extremists returning from GSPC terrorist camp. The money in their possession was also seized. It had in 2002 fouled attempts by GSPC to establish terrorist cells in Katsina and Kano in Nigeria. The leader of the network, Yakubu Musa Kafanchin was arrested and prosecuted and money and equipment found in their possession confiscated. Similarly, the activities of Harun Asharu, another agent of GSPC financing extremist and terrorist activities by laundering proceeds from smuggled goods was detected and dismantled. Several properties including technical equipment were seized and Mr. Sharo arrested and detained. Another attempt in 2003 by another Taliban group to set up camp in Yob State was dismantled. Banking secrecy and confidentiality has been abolished in Nigeria by virtue of Section 12, 4, of the Money Laundering, Prohibition, Act 2774. At the regional level, Nigeria has contributed greatly to operationalization of Giaba, the West African FATF-style regional body, established to combat money laundering and terrorist financing in the sub-region. The above letter was written by the Nigerian government to the UN, it lays out the measures it has taken to fight terrorism in Nigeria. Take special note of the names mentioned. A WikiLeaks cable from 2002 confirms that this arrest actually did take place, only for the suspect to be released inexplicably after 27 days in detention. At this point, let me remind viewers who Nas Reddin is the owner of Nasco Company Limited, Joss, Plateau State. The producer of Nasco Cornflakes. Please take note of the name Nas Reddin because it will be frequently reflect to later in the course this documentary. For those who are not aware, Yakubu Musa Kafanchin, also known as Sheikh Yakubu Musa Katsina and Yakubu Musa Hassan, is a founding member of the Azala movement, Jibwis, and is in fact, the current chairman of its board of trustees and the chairman of the Katsina State Jibwis chapter. He is a widely respected Islamic cleric and a very close personal friend and public associate of no prizes for guessing Isa Ali Pantami. Yes, that Isa Pantami, a minister of communications and digital economy in Buhari's government. Mr. Kafanchin was even recently named as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center a Jordanian government-affiliated NGO. More on that later. Apparently Mr. Kafanchin has been known to the Nigerian security forces as the leader of a terror network trying to set up terror cells in Katsina and Kano as far back as 2002. Keep that date in mind because it will become even more important as we unravel this further. According to official Nigerian government communication to the UN, 
This real-life Islamic terror organizer is known to have affiliations with a certain GSPC group trying to carry out terror attacks in Nigeria, and he was even arrested for it in 2005 four whole years before the world ever heard of a Boko Haram. Yet in 2021 he is not only a free man, but a powerful free man, with access to federal ministers, state governors and also President Muhammadu Buhari himself. And then there is the GSPC angle. GSPC stands for Group Salafist Pour La Predication et Le Combat, Salafist Group for Preaching in Combat. A full primer on the origin of the group and what it stands for, is strict Islamic laws and the spread of Sharia law. It is an illegal Salafi terrorist organization based in Algeria which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. It specializes in providing training, funding and support to Islamists and jihadi fighters around the world using a vast global network of smugglers, money launderers and rat lines. Which brings us to the second name in the above letter excerpt. Al-Haji Shara Haruna, in the Nigerian government's own words, is a GSPC agent who funds the activities of people like Kabra Sokoto by laundering proceeds from smuggled goods. He too was arrested and held on terror financing charges. Somehow he too, is not only a free man today, but a powerful one in his own right too. It will not surprise the reader to find out that Al-Haji Haruna is also a ranking member of the Azala movement. According to these posts I dug up from Facebook accounts linked to the Kano State Azala movement chapter, Al-Haji Haruna is the deputy president of the Kano State chapter of Jibwis. Like Yakubu Kafanchin, this indicted terror funder not only retains his position in Nigeria's most influential Muslim body, but is also a respected Islamic preacher with access to the who is who of Nigerian politics and governance. Even more interestingly, when I do some digging into Mr. Haruna, I discover something potentially even more alarming. It will be recall recalled that in September 2021, CBN Governor Godwin Emafiel claimed that a significant portion of dollars bought by Bureau de Change Operators in Nigeria goes into illegal importation of arms. Speaking at the end of the monthly Monetary Policy Committee meeting he said, Whether it's Boko Haram, kidnapping and all sorts of nefarious activities, Bureau de Change take our country's dollar and sell to people to go and buy arms and ammunition to come and hurt us. That's what people want us to continue to do. We cannot do that any longer. We can't. If you have any legal, legitimate business you want to conduct, please take your business to a bank, they will sell you Forex. A search of Nigeria's Corporate Affairs Commission database for the name Shara Haruna turns up a plethora of companies registered under the name Dan Daima. Please take of the name Dan Daima, a company owned by Shara Haruna. A man identified by the Nigerian government itself as a security threat for funding terror via money laundering was somehow allowed to own and operate a bureau to change, which according to the CBN governor, could well have been doing precisely that. A CBN circular from October 2020 confirms that at least as recently as last year, Harun Ashara was allowed to run a bureau to change in Nigeria, potentially giving him access to the very funding infrastructure that he should not have under any circumstances. My question is why should a man that has been indicted for terrorism be allowed to operate Bureau to Change? The truth of the matter is that these terrorists and their sympathizers have infiltrated every segment of Nigerian government. Part 3 A glance at one of the other Dan Daima business entities shows that even the email address, address used to register this entity purportedly a petroleum company, albeit one with zero identifiable corporate footprint belongs to Dan Daima Bureau de Change, which says everything about how important the Bureau de Change is to Harun Asharu. The question left unanswered is why? In case the viewer is wondering if this picture can get any worse, the answer is yes. It can, and it will. Take note of this name, Zaradin Shara Haruna, is a son to Shara Haruna, so it is no surprise for him to show up as a director on his father's bureau to change registration documents. There's just one problem. Remember Emma Feel saying that bureau to change facilitate terror financing? Well just a month before he made that comment, a circular was sent out to banks by the CBN with the names of 18 companies and individuals whose bank accounts were to be frozen with a PND, post no debit mandate. Very unusually, no reason was given for the instruction, and also unusually, on a list made up of corporate accounts, there was an account belonging to an individual. His name is Nasreddin. 
We now rejoin our Eritrean friend in the year 2006. The Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, NFIU, has recently been gazetted, and one of the first things its counterterrorism unit does is to freeze all assets linked to NASCO Group Nigeria Limited. Apparently, Mr. Nasreddin has been doing some creative accounting to hide the fact that he is moving money around the world to fund Islamist terror organizations. Or at least, that was what the Nigerian government itself wrote to the UN in the same letter. The Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, NFIU, also became operational in January 2005. It is now the only central body responsible for the receipt, analyses, and dissemination of intelligence packages to law enforcement agencies and regulations. It also exchanges information with other FIUS around the world. It receives suspicious transaction reports, STR, and currency transaction reports, CTR, from banks, other financial institutions and designated financial institutions. The NFIU has a counterterrorism unit which in conjunction with other law enforcement and security agencies, is responsible for the monitoring of Nigeria's exposure and vulnerability to domestic and international terrorism, monitor developments and trends in domestic and international terrorism, assess and evaluate the potential and scope of terrorism in Nigeria, and formulate strategy and action plans to tackle the manifestations of terrorist financing in Nigeria. It has so far profiled militant groups, non-governmental organizations and non-profit organizations to determine their bases of operations and sources of funding. The unit is also monitoring and developing databases on illegal oil bunkering slash mining activities, individual slash groups involved, their affiliates and patrons, sources and destinations of the financial proceeds. The offense of terrorism and terrorist financing is provided for under Section 15 of the EFCC Act 2004. Under this law, assets of terrorists and their associates can be frozen and confiscated. They can also be trilled and convicted by a competent court if found guilty. Implementation The provisions of the EFCC Act relating to terrorism are being vigorously enforced. So far, two convictions at the Federal High Court, Kaduna dated October 10, 2004 and October 21, 2005, have been recorded on acts of terrorism. Besides, the EFCC has taken steps to ensure compliance with the United Nations Resolution 1267. Following the information furnished by the UN and United States Embassy in Nigeria, alleging that NASCO Group Nigerla Limited is owned by Ahmed Idris Nasreddin, a designate of both the US and UN as an individual belonging to Al-Qaeda or associated with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban or Usama bin Laden, the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja on Friday, March 3, 2006, granted an application stopping and freezing the financial and economic assets, including business properties and things within Niger Nigeria. Belonging to Ahmed Idris Nasreddin, or associated with Ahmed Idris Nasreddin, and his Nas Trade Nigeria Limited and three other companies in that group. The assets were accordingly forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria in the interim. A WikiLeaks cable from 2002 hints at American pause on the subject of freezing NASCO's Nigerian assets due to the economic implications for Plateau State and political implications in Nigeria. The real proof of Nasreddin's double life, however, comes from the U.S. Treasury Department which publishes a comprehensive account of how he launders and moves money around the world for terrorist entities. Want to hear the rail kicker? Nasreddin has been funding and laundering money for none other than GSPC the Algerian terrorist group which Yakubu Katsina and Shara Haruna are also involved with at the exact same time. The Nigerian jihadis had been trained in Algerian camps in 2002 were later returned to Nigeria and made up the core terrorist group of what became known as Boko Haram. And what a coincidence NASCO is also based in Jos, which so happens to be the headquarters of the Azala movement and its many North African dalliances. Using money made from selling market-leading products to Nigerian consumers, a cross-border network of terrorism is being nurtured that will someday kill the very kids eating NASCO cornflakes every morning. And it's all thanks to this nice gentleman from Eritrea. Nasreddin, however, is a very rich man. Like all very rich men, he appears to have a way around problems that would ground other people. In 2005, 
Lisa Myers and Aram Rostin of the NBC News Investigative Unit discovered that despite his de designation as a terror financier in the U.S., Nasreddin's Nigerian business empire and his Italian hotel are still operating as normal. Quoted in the story, Victor Comras, a former terror finance expert at the State Department says, This isn't a loophole, this is failure to implement the sanctions appropriately. Nasreddin, owner of Nasco Company Limited, has been involved in terrorist financing. Let's put him out of business by not consuming his products because, the more Nigerians consume his products the more money available for him to finance terrorism. That would prove easier said than done because just two years later in 2007, the LA Times publishes a story indicating that to all intents and purposes Nasreddin has cut some kind of deal with the US government, likely involving asset forfeitures, to get his name off the list of terror financiers. He has been indicted for funding terror, some of which has found its way into the lives of the Nigerian consumers who have made him fabulously wealthy, but he is off the hook. For the people who have died in the Mad Allah Christmas Day bombings facilitated by the people he funded and supported, there will be no justice. Nasreddin gets to hand over Nasco to his son, and he lives out the rest of his life in peace and comfort, dying at the ripe old age of 96. Friends and Alliances in High Places I mentioned earlier that the date of Yakubu Katsuna's initial attempt to establish terror cells and Taliban training camps in Kano and Katsuna was important. Here is why. Remember Abubakar Gumi's stated position that Muslims should never accept a non-Muslim as ruler? It just so happens that the concerted push for Sharia law across 12 of northern Nigeria states lines up perfectly with the election of Olusegun Obasanjo as president in 1999. Examining the eras of Shihu Shagari, Muhammadu Buhari, Ibrahim Babanjida, Sani Abacha, and Abdul Salam Abubakar as consecutive Muslim Nigerian heads of state, it is nearly impossible to establish the existence of directed and coordinated push for Islamic law in that area. Following Obasanjo's entry however, Zamfara, Kano, Sokoto, Katsina, Bachi, Borno, Jigawa, Kebi, Yob, Kaduna, Niger and Gom decided in quick succession to embrace a separate penal code from southern Nigeria, based on Sharia law. Understanding the political resonance of the Azala movement in northern Nigeria and the power wielded by the indicted terror financiers and terrorists who still sit on its board is key to understanding two things about terrorism in Nigeria. Boko Haram is a logical development growing out of the rise of political Islam in Nigeria, with its roots in Salafism, popularized by Abu Bakar Gumi and his ideological children. It is impossible to divorce Abubakar Gumi's use of Saudi money and Wahhabi indoctrination in the 1970s, from the adoption of Sharia law in northern Nigeria, the rise of violent Salafists like Abubakar Shako and Issa Pantami, and the eventual inevitable mass uprising against the Nigerian state that will take place in the north. While the Boko Haram brand is an unattractive one, the goals of Boko Haram are by no means unattractive to those who make up the ideological core of the Azala movement, which is Nigeria's most influential Islamic section. Amina Dorawa who famously praised the September 11th attacks in a 2001 sermon with a quote claiming that Allah is a suicide bomber, would later become the inaugural chair of Kano's Hizbah police and also remains a high-ranking Azala movement member. With sympathizers and collaborators up to and including President Buhari himself, the Azala sect has no incentive or reason to fundamentally rethink or change its ideology, which is directly and provably linked to Salafist terrorism. As long as Issa Pantami's Mr. Zero Zero, a reference to an ideologically pure Muslim with zero tolerance for bid'ah, don't forget. Bid'ah means no to innovation or change, but Islam in its purest form. That is, a hardline Salafist, retains his obvious and unapologetic sympathy for an organization with clear and ongoing links to the enemy he claims to be fighting against as Nigeria's president, the Azala movement has no incentive to reinvent itself. There is no way that the Nigerian president is not aware of Yakubu Musa Hassan Katsina's history as a known terrorist, as well as the Azala movement's extremely problematic history and current composition. And yet, as recently as 2018, President Buhari was pictured in Aso Rock meeting with Azala movement President Abdullahi Balalau, Yakubu Musa Hassan Katsina, Kabaragam and Ibrahim Jalo Jalingo, these are indicted persons with terrorism. 
It is either I have more access to information about his friends and associates than the Nigerian president does, with all the amount of intelligence and information gathering agencies at his disposal, or he knows all this already, and he has chosen a side. Clearly, to the Azala movement, this picture taken in 2018 was a statement. An Obasanjo government may have arrested Yakubu Katsuna and his likes in 2005, but 13 years later, Katsuna's ideological ally is in office standing solidly next to him, as he stood solidly next to ISA Pantami. The Azala movement has won and everybody else has lost. The only other angle of high-level involvement not yet addressed is that of the Jordanian government. Recall that Yakubu Katsuna was named among the world's 500 most influential Muslims by a Jordanian state-backed NGO? Well it turns out that the NGO in question the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center is itself affiliated with the Royal Aal Albait Institute for Islamic Thought. A visit to this institute's website reveals something strange. One of its publications titled Report on the Interreligious Tensions and Crisis in Nigeria published in May 2012 has the following to say about ending violence between Muslims and Christians in Nigeria. This report, produced by a state-funded NGO in Jordan as far back as 2012, is prima facie evidence of a coordinated international campaign of strategic disinformation for the purpose of framing the reality of terrorism in Nigeria in a way that is completely dishonest. Making reference to alleged income disparity between Nigeria's Christian South and Muslim North, the report attempts to portray the latter as the victim of economic bullying and poverty, without citing data to support this conclusion. Very tellingly, at a time when conversations about violence related to nomadic cattle herding were not yet present in Nigeria's political equation, a Jordanian organization with links to Yakubu Katsina, a known Nigerian terrorist, was already recommending grazing routes as a solution for a problem that, for the most part, did not actually exist yet. Nine years later, the question is how did they know? If you think Nigeria will be free from terrorism one day, you just have to rethink, with all the indicted persons in the corridor of power? Thanks for watching.